so we're ready to get started. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you. Uh, it is April the 2nd, 2020. Um, I am uh, sitting in my library at the Calvary Road Baptist Church in Monrovia, California. So let me invite you to join with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We would ask that you might provide wisdom to our leaders at various levels of government, both at the national, state, county, and city, that you might give them wisdom, that you might work in their lives, that we might be a credible testimony of the gospel in the lives of those who know us and who observe us. Please bless our study of your word tonight, and we will thank you. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to start myself on a timer because I'm going to try to keep myself to exactly 30 minutes, and so um, you can count on that. Let me warn you, as I did last night, uh, please do not blindly trust any source of information without independent verification. I don't care whether they're government officials. I don't care whether they're media people. Um, I don't care who they are, including me. We do not have biblical authorization to accept at face value the comments made by anyone about matters of fact unless they are attested to by multiple independent witnesses of the fact. In the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, it's the principle of two or three witnesses. Um, it's the basis on which uh, English common law is based in our legal system. And we have been getting in trouble in the United States in the last few years as we drift away from that uh, listening rather to loud and energetic um, um, comments and accusations that have no independent verification of fact. Used to be journalism in the United States uh, required a multiplicity of sources. That's no longer true, and it would be good for you as an individual, and it would be good for me as an individual to keep in mind that just because somebody says something that they believe to be true doesn't make it so. And so we, the only thing we know that is true uh, is the Bible, God's Word. Everything else, we need multiple attestations um, of fact in order to rely upon it. So let's be wise in that, ses in that way. My plan is to provide a, a Zoom session um, every weeknight and Saturday night, that will be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday at 7 p.m. for approximately 30 minutes. Um, that can also be seen on YouTube. If you want to watch the YouTube live, the YouTube live stream, you can do that. Uh, but as I learn about Zoom, I'm going to make it so that it's at least at least theoretically possible for someone to ask questions. Um, you can also, if, if you want to, um, tune in um, or, or watch us live stream on, on Sundays. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a church service Sundays at 1045 in the morning and 6 p.m. Um, and it will be uploaded, as is our practice, to YouTube as well. Uh, my, as I mentioned Briefly before, my plan is to take questions at the end of Zoom sessions. I may not be able to today because I may be overwhelmed by the technology, but it's my plan to do that and also to respond to questions sent to this. Uh, can, can you see this email address okay? It says pastor at calvaryroadbaptist.church. That's pastor at calvaryroadbaptist.church. Baptist.church, and if you want to send me a question to to uh, uh, to deal with that, um, we can uh, we can address those questions. Carlos, do you see that? Can anybody else see that? Let me uh, do something real quick. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm also going to do one last thing. So we just got we just got zoomed bomb um, by um, what's the name of the congressman from New York that used to um, Huma Abedin's husband? I don't know. 
think we just got uh, Zoom bombed by a former um, Democratic uh, Congressional House member. But anyway, uh, you can you can email uh, those uh, those questions, and I'll be glad to deal with them uh, as quickly as possible. Um, we're doing a little bit of oh, gotcha. Okay, we're doing a little bit of housekeeping here so that uh, Carlos can get rid of, uh, of nasty people uh, who think that somehow my life will be enhanced by them showing pictures of portions of their anatomy that they ought to keep covered up. And uh, so that's, that's not good. But uh, just a reminder from my little Carlito, uh, to access these Zoom sessions requires only that you know the church's phone number uh, 626-357-2711 from now on, and um, and those are the those are the announcements. Um, this evening, I want to bring to you uh, a, a devotional message that I have titled "Isolation." Um, you know, I'm a guy that likes to read history. Um, I like to read everything, but I I like to read history. And one of the things that I've, I've noticed from my readings of history is that there, there are a group of people that are, seem to be um, uh, more pronounced in, um, in the United States of America than, um, than in other places, perhaps Canada. But uh, they used to be called loners. They are more often identified or they self-identify as introverts. Uh, and these are people who opt for social isolation by avoiding social contacts in urban areas. That is to say, they're people that would rather stay away from the crowd. Um, and if they want to do that, that's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but back in the old days, they would be uh, back when I was young, they would be they would either be identified or self-identify as introverts. They are people who opt for social isolation by avoiding social contacts in urban areas, um, and or or by living in remote settings. They may live, you know, way out in the country, uh, up on a mountaintop someplace, um, and that's fine. If they want to do that, that's fine. But they used to be called loners, and, and they're called sometimes in, introverts. In the 17th and 18th, as well as in the 19th century, at least the first part of it, some few men uh, in North America pushed westward to hunt and to trap and to explore. But when you look into it, when you think about it, when you contemplate it, when you read histories and diaries, you will see that though, uh, though men did that back in the day, almost no one in that era ever engaged in such activities without companions. A few moderns and no primitives attempted to live their lives alone. Uh, the isolation of Daniel Defoe's character, Robinson Crusoe, before Friday was introduced as a character in that novel, caused his first readers to think that it was a true story. They thought it was uh, uh, an autobiography or a biography of someone uh, rather than a novel. Because back in the day, um, the thought of being entirely alone um, was foreign, and it was frightening. Now, there are people today that uh, prefer to be alone. They prefer lives of relative isolation, and, um, and, and they think, some of them at least, think that it's always been that way. Um, I beg to differ. Even in, middle, e even in medieval times, uh, people lived differently than we moderns looking back in history usually imagine them living their lives and existing. I have a book, um, the second volume of, of, uh, of a two-volume work. It's called The History of Private Life. And um, volume two 
deals with revelations of the medieval world. It's published by Belknap and Harvard Press. And uh, let me just read uh, a sentence from it, because when I, when I first read it some years ago, it was a complete surprise to me. Uh, on, on page um, 318 of this second volume, uh, the authors write, In the Middle Ages, the solitary man was considered dangerous. The solitary man was considered dangerous. Why? Why, why would people think that? Because back in the day, normal people were terrified of being alone. Because to be alone was to be vulnerable to attack. Um, imagine how a person feels back before the CCP virus when people would be out at all hours of the day and night in, in, in all parts of the city. When someone was walking down a deserted street in the city at night and, um, and he was frightened, because of the possibility that he would be set upon by people, and there he would be all by himself and vulnerable. Um, that's what it was like for everyone living in the, in the Middle Ages. Uh, they, because it was a time of lawlessness. It was a time when uh, most people uh, were not in a place where the rule of law was enforced. And so they recognized that if they were not in a group of people, if they, if they couldn't mutually protect each other, then they would be vulnerable to attack. If you're, if you're listening to this, you, your mind might be wandering and you might say, well, oh, okay, what about, what about religious hermits? Most people think of religious hermits of being aloof from others, that they live their entire lives in isolation from others and, and, um, and that they were very, very isolated. Well, I remember the very first time I went to Israel, and uh, I went with a, a group of pastors, and uh, we were guided around the country by some Israeli uh, archaeologists. And um, one of the places that they took us was a... Um, um, what would you call it, a monastery, and it was in the Wadi Kilt. There, there, is, a, there is a ravine that runs from um, uh, Jericho all the way just about to Jerusalem, and when the Lord Jesus Christ taught his parable of the Good Samaritan, what would almost certainly enter into the minds of most people who heard him teach that parable is they would think about that that ravine, because that was the most direct route from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho, and that was almost certainly the route that the Lord Jesus Christ and his men took uh, after he gave sight to blind Bartimaeus and after he was in the house of Zacchaeus. That would be the route that he would travel to Jerusalem. Well, I, there, was this, there was this monastery, and I was surprised to see it there. And uh, the archaeologist told us, I, I, I raised the issue. I said, well, what about the hermits? And they said, contrary to what most Westerners think, the hermits did not live lives of complete and total isolation. Now, they were relatively more isolated than most people, but they always lived within walking distance of a monastery, and the, and the hermits would come into the monastery several times a week uh, to get fresh food and and uh, uh, to get water and uh, to interact with others who were living that kind of lifestyle that was basically a lifestyle that was supported by religious devotees who would send money from Europe uh, and it would make its way to the monastery and the monastery would make it possible for these guys to live um, away from everyone else in relative isolation and obscurity, doing absolutely nothing but contemplation and, and that kind of thing, and they would be supported by the gifts and donations of others. Uh, they would sleep in, in caves. Um, they would, uh, uh, um, that's where they would provide, have, find their... But... Um, Hermits were always tied to a monastery that was not far away so that they could go uh, regularly to visit for food 
water, and conversation. Uh, Carlos, I've got a beep here, and I don't know what it is. Anyway, let's go back farther than the medieval times to Bible times. Uh, how many of us, maybe you're like me, how many of us grew up thinking that Joseph and Mary traveled alone from Nazareth to Bethlehem where the Christ child would be born um, at what we call what we celebrate every year is Christmas. Um, all of the pictures that are painted of them by the artists down through the years depict them as just this th these two people, Mary on the back of a donkey, uh, Joseph leading the donkey, and them walking south from Nazareth uh, alongside the Jordan River and then turning in and going to Jerusalem, through Jerusalem, into Bethlehem, where the Christ child was born. Um, that's the way all the pictures portray it, but such travel was never attempted by any sane person back in those days. And the reason was it was simply too dangerous. Because if you were alone, you were vulnerable. So for the Savior to go into the desert by himself where he was tempted of the devil for 40 days was a most unusual thing, unusual for the isolation that someone would go into the desert by himself for 40 days was very unusual as well as unusual for the satanic temptation. Only someone like the maniac of Gadara would live their lives completely alone, and he would not be referred to as a rational person being indwelt uh, by so many demons. In addition to that, have you taken note of the fact that the prophets of the Old Testament times were almost certainly never alone? Think about it. The prophet Isaiah is closely associated with the Jewish nobility of Judah, and he lived in and around the environs of the palace in Jerusalem. Jeremiah had with him at almost all times Baruch. Elijah and Elisha were surrounded by young companions in the school of the prophets. Go back even farther. Do you imagine Abraham to have been alone? I remember for years and years and years when I read the book of Genesis, my, in my imagination, I imagined Abraham basically living a solitary life. Uh, there was nephew Lot nearby. There was Sarah. Um, but basically, I, I imagined him as living basically a lonely life. Um, however, we know that he had at least 318 trained fighting men in his employ. We learn that from Genesis chapter 14 and verse 14. And if he had 318 young trained warriors, he certainly had a lot more people than that in his, in his entourage. So I suspect also his son Isaac was uh, someone who was never alone at any time in his life, and I would be surprised if Jacob, when he left his parents to go to the east uh, to live with Uncle Laban, um, though the Bible does not refer to other people, and we tend, therefore, to conclude that, that uh, Jacob made that journey all by himself, um, I, I would suggest that it was, it's very, very unlikely that Jacob or anyone else of that era made such a trip all by themselves. Uh, Joseph was by himself only when he went looking for his brothers, and after being betrayed by his brothers, when he was down in the pit, he was certainly alone. But his brothers are never portrayed in the biblical narrative as being alone. Uh, consider also Moses, if you would, raised in Pharaoh's household, do you imagine he ever went anywhere by himself? When Moses slew the Egyptian, it would be unimaginable for an Egyptian nobleman, and that's what Moses was, he was an Egyptian nobleman for all intents and purposes, 
it would be unimaginable for an Egyptian nobleman of that era to have gone anywhere without his manservant being at his side, at least one. Even if manservants are not mentioned in the biblical narrative, I would be astonished to get to heaven to discover that Moses went into the Midian desert by himself, even though no one is specifically mentioned to have been with him? Now you might be wondering, why am I bringing all of these things to your attention? Why am I bringing all of these things up um, for your consideration? I'm doing that for two things, for two reasons this evening. First, so that you will contemplate how difficult it was for anyone in ancient times to break with their social or cultural group or tribe to trust Christ as their Savior, knowing that in doing so, they would likely lose everything they likely held dear. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, um, that was an astonishing step to take. Not like it is in the United States where family members may be slightly chagrined at you, may, there may be the furrowed brow. Uh, throughout most of history and most cultures, when you, when you trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, you were making a break with social custom, with your cultural group identity, or your tribe. This is what evangelism faces with those of different ethnic backgrounds who are far more closely tied to their social group and family than most of us who were born and raised in the USA will ever be able to appreciate. Uh, the family ties and the, the social knitting together of Americans is nothing like it is uh, among most ethnic groups in most parts of the world or throughout most of history. Throughout most of human history, trusting Christ as your Savior required counting the very high cost of discipleship. This is also something of a clue to the value those in other cultures place on their church connection when they come to Christ. Having lost so much when they trusted Christ, they discover as new Christians coming into a church relationship, they discover that in the Christian congregation, so much more is given to them by the Savior than they ever could have gotten from their family or their ethnic group. So that's the first thing I'd like for us to consider uh, in this time of social isolation as a result of the, of the CCP virus. The second thing um, is so you will contemplate the impossibility, yes, the impossibility, that the Christian life once begun as an individual turned to Christ could be lived as it is presented in Scripture apart from the community the community of Christians, which is the church of Jesus Christ. Because we live in the uniquely solitary culture of the American Marlboro Man ideal, which is a historic anomaly, uh, most cultures throughout history have been nothing like the United States over the last hundred years. Um, and, and it isn't uh, it isn't a particularly healthy uh, dynamic for so gregarious a creature as God made us human beings to be. We are social creatures. And more so than we frequently realize, we need to interact with people. And we have a difficult time here in the United States, in our culture, we have a difficult time sensing the value of a congregation's body life potential in our lives and the lives of other people because we're so unused to it by previous experience. More specifically, we find it challenging to learn that spiritual gifts 
cannot be properly exercised in isolation from others. When you have a, when you have a spiritual gift, uh, that is a supernatural ability that is given to you by God at the time of your conversion. Some gifts can be exercised quite early on in the Christian's life. Some, such as the gift of teaching, require greater maturity and, and the acquisition of knowledge uh, over time so that skills can be developed. But each and every spiritual gift is, is most fully used and most truly effective um, when it is used um, in the company of other people. And spiritual gifts cannot be properly exercised. They cannot be fully exercised, perhaps would be a better way of putting it, in isolation from others. That's, that's number one. Number two, love cannot be fully expressed to others or received from others in isolation from others. Now, I'm not, please, before, before someone protests and says, well, you know, uh, uh, my husband is a veteran and when he went overseas and was deployed, I loved him every bit as much when he was on deployment as I've ever loved him in my life. I understand that. Um, and I'm not disagreeing with you at all. But while the two of you were apart from each other, your ability to convey love to him, to communicate in a substantial way to him, and his ability to reciprocate back to you was marginalized by the separation. Why? Because throughout most of human history, our ability to express love to others and receive love from others is best accommodated in the presence of others. So that's the second thing. And thirdly, there is the tremendous benefit of group testimony uh, that the Apostle Paul referred to in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses uh, 23, 25, and, and 27. Uh, let, let, me, let me try to read that to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 23, 25, and 27, where the Apostle Paul writes these words. Now, I'd like you to try to imagine this in some other situation than in a congregational setting. Verse 23, the Apostle Paul writes, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, uh, verse 25, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face will he worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. How would he know that God is in you of a truth if he was not, unless he was there with you? And then in verse 26, it begins, how is it then, brethren, when you come together? Every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. And so I, I, I mention that to you so that you will see that um, there are certain things in the Bible that we miss because we ignore the fact that certain things were simply taken for granted in the Bible. And what is taken for granted in the Bible is an absence of technology. The fact that we don't have internet when the Bible was written, we don't have television when the Bible was written, we don't have telegraph when the Bible was written. And so in order for you to love someone, in order for you to communicate with someone, in order for you to exercise your spiritual gift with someone, you have to be there. Um, and... Um, we do not, you say, but, but we have technology, we have internet, we have live streaming, yes, we have social media. But any one of you who have ever been on social media, whether it be texting or these kinds of things where you're not actually hearing the voice of the other person, you know that uh, it's not the same and, and frequently people can, people can uh, completely misunderstand what you said by, by virtue of the fact that all they saw were the words. Uh, and I'm not sure that the, the group testimony that we have as a congregation 
can ever be recuperated via live stream or using social media. One of the most powerful testimonies that we have to a person who is not a believer in Jesus Christ is what that person sees and what that person hears. His observations of us while we are worshiping God, while we are interacting with other believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, what's the takeaway from these considerations? Um, and I'm just about to run out of time, so I'm going to turn this thing off and wrap it up. What is our takeaway from these considerations of historical reality, both in and out of the biblical record? I, I think there are two that I'd like to leave with you this evening. First, let us reflect upon so that we will fervently pray for our soon return to congregational worship. Christians not gathering is unimaginable. It's inconceivable. Not only do people not live real lives in isolation from others, but as I pointed out last night, and you can see on the the YouTube video from last night, spiritual gifts cannot be exercised, not fully, and genuine love cannot be fully offered or received in isolation from other people, no matter what technological ties you have to them via live streaming or Skype or Zoom or, or social media. It's just not the same. Then, as you read your Bible, consciously and conscientiously remove the tinted cultural lenses through which we look at what we are reading in, in Scripture, whereby we imagine a personal isolation and a separateness uh, that actually did not exist for God's people in those days gone by, especially in the Bible. We read about Luke's account of Joseph and Mary heading to Bethlehem, and just because Dr. Luke doesn't mention other people in that party of travelers, we think there wasn't a party of travelers accompanying Joseph and Mary. Well, let's, let's make sure that we correct that understanding of what we're reading. So I close with this. Read the Psalms and ponder the likelihood of the psalmist, despite his feelings of loneliness, because there are certain Psalms that we read where it's obvious he was lonely. He felt lonely. But let's, let's ponder the likelihood that despite the psalmist's feelings of loneliness, it is unlikely that he was ever actually alone for any length of time. From the time he defeated Goliath, that young shepherd boy, David, was surrounded by followers because he was a leader and he had followers. And when we know he was alone, or alone in his thoughts, he got into trouble, didn't he? When he was alone in his thoughts one night during the time when kings go to battle, uh, he got into trouble with a woman named Bathsheba after speaking to an ever-present manservant and asking about her. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 2. We think, oh, David was, was, uh, was on a rooftop or on a ledge or on a balcony and he was all by himself when he looked down upon Bathsheba. Uh, was he? Was he alone? If he was alone, how could he then turn to someone and inquire about Bathsheba? No, David was not alone. Rarely, were people in Scripture alone. And so God's plan for God's people, not that there's anything wrong with you being alone in your study for a time of prayer, a time of reading Scripture, a time of reflection, uh, that's fine. And, and if you're the kind of person that I am and you spend time with people, you need to get away uh, retreat just a little bit to recharge your batteries. I know I do. There's nothing wrong with that. 
But let's understand that the Christian life, by and large, was designed by God to be lived in the company of other people. And not just other people in your family. Um, I was talking to a man today, and he said that in during this time of self-quarantining, he said he felt like he was in prison. Why did he say that? Because he is a gregarious man who enjoys the company of other people. And being advanced in age and his children and grandchildren grown, he's not in a place where he can interact the way he wants to in a way that's valuable to him. So would you join with me in prayer that God will get us through this thing uh, rather quickly so that we can go back to the norm of congregating several times a week and living our Christian lives in the company of other believers and in front of lost people the way God designed. Thank you for joining with me this evening. Let's conclude in a word of prayer, shall we? Thank you, Father, for your goodness. We appreciate the opportunity. We're thankful for the technology. Where would we be without the technology? Yet let us understand let us have the wisdom and the discernment to recognize that the technology, no matter how good it is, is no substitute for being in the company of brothers and sisters in Christ who have gathered for worship and for service. Blessed to that end that we get through this so that we can then reach out into our community and they can comfortably come and join us in worship and perhaps they too will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. We ask this, Father, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and good night.